welcome to this, our session, our second uh, major day, second uh, session. Uh, and the topic today is going to be Empires uh, of the Orient. We're going to go in the order as outlined in a go uh, And uh, the uh, procedure of the same as yesterday, uh, 15 minutes please max. Uh, and then uh, you to uh, prepare yourselves for uh, questions, comments, uh, and a third uh, So we'll, uh, I won't introduce the speakers, they are uh, outlined in the program. So without any more ado, uh, we'll begin. So, uh, Lauren, please, over to you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. How might a comic book <clears throat> bring an empire back from the dead? This study attempts to read Asao Takamori and Tetsuya Chiba's influential 1968 manga, <clears throat> Ashtana Joe, Tomorrow's Joe released during Japan's transformation from defeated military empire to re-emerging economic and cultural superpower as a regenerative imperialist allegory. Opening with the pugilistic initiation of its orphan protagonist, Joe Yabuki, the embodiment of post-World War II occupied Japan, the narrative unfolds through his succession of bouts with increasingly challenging rivals, first domestically, then internationally, culminating in his challenge for the world crown. Upon close reading, each opponent appears to represent a particular stage of colonization throughout Japanese imperialist history. While Asian champion Kim Ryu-hee, a Korean War orphan and Vietnam veteran, evokes the Japanese colonization of Korea, and the primitive Malaysian contender Hari Mao embodies binaries of competing colonial powers, British and Japanese, human and animal, nomic and anomic. <clears throat> Such episodes serve to redefine Japan's power relations with the nations and peoples they previously encountered through military aggression. Thus, the text offers not just metaphors for reprocessing Japan's historical past, but the mythological guidelines for its future. From a human vantage point, empires are ways of encountering the world. As hyper-objects or organisms, empires, in order to grow and sustain themselves, require not just material, but narrative resources. The Japanese empire... <laughs> the Japanese empire at the zenith of growth in 1942 looked like this. Three years later, it shrunk to the following size. Uh, 23 years later, Japan's economic and industrial recovery necessitated new narratives. Ashtana Joe serialized over 4,000 pages from 1968 to 1973 has proven an endlessly sustainable generator of personal, national, and imperial mythologies through its various anime, live action, and film reconfigurations to present. The title character Yabuki Joe, an orphan, arrives in Tokyo out of nowhere with nothing but a sense of humor, resilience, and fighting spirit. Immediately likable for his rapport with the younger orphan kids, <clears throat> the Chinese characters, uh, Chinese characters that uh, comprising his name connote one well suited to martial endeavors, one who can fire an arrow, strike a blow with precision and expertise as well as one who has great stamina and endurance. Fredbear jo Joe finds his way from juvenile detention to a mentor in Tange Dante, a former professional boxer struggling with alcoholism, and together they convert his shack into a makeshift gym to pursue their dreams of winning the world crown. Joe's defining bout at the domestic level comes against Rikiishi Toru, who he first fought in juvenile detention. Much bigger, Riki Ishii cuts 30 pounds to make the grudge match reality. Although Riki Ishii wins, he dies from a combination of extreme dehydration and Joe's well-timed punch to the temple. For some time, Joe is so traumatized, he is unable to hit opponents in the head. After further trials at the domestic level, Joe secures a shot at the OPPF Orient and Pacific Boxing Federation title held by a South Korean Kim ryu hee or Kim yong bi In Kim, Joe faces one of many opposite doubles. Kim, too, is an orphan. The two further comprise a yin-yang subtext of cold versus hot. Yabuki's fiery intensity in the ring is contrasted over and over with Kim's cold calculation 
After spending Kim sparring, Joe reflects. He never gets flustered. He's just like ice. I've been in the ring burning fire against fire, but this time I'm up against ice. Described as a computer boxer, Kim's eyes are cold and blank. Joe's flicker with life and light. Kim's strictly clocked training regiments are daunting, and he makes no mistakes. The longer he trains, the stronger he gets. Tange is so frightened by Kim, he pleads with Joe to move up to featherweight to avoid the match. Yet there are signs of weakness. As one of Kim's dorm room mates reports, he washed his hands all night long. Even though his hands turned purple, he wouldn't stop washing. As his PTSD-induced Lady Macbeth-like hand washing later <coughs> indicates, Kim is static, overcalculated, frozen in time, while Joe is flexible, improvisational, able to learn and adjust to his opponent on the spot in the ring. The episode is highly marked. Kim's very presence in Japan constitutes a threat. He trains out of the Asia Boxing Club, whose members wear jackets labeled Asia on their backs. When Kim beats up his overmatched Japanese sparring partner, Kim literally has Asia on the ropes. Kim and Joe vie for regional conquest with the understanding that controlling Asia will entitle them to a shot at Jose Mendoza and the world. <clears throat> Joe's intention, clear from the outset, reflect the Japanese Meiji era consciousness and reluctance to identify as part of Asia. My goal is not the Orient, but the world. In an uncommon pre-fight dinner encounter initiated by Kim, he reveals the horrific trauma that is the source of the strength. Watching Joe cut his steak, Kim brags that his pre-fight meal is a cup of lemon tea, and then tells his story. Path uh, Kim's pathological condition was caused by the wartime Oedipal trauma of killing a soldier. Uh, he finds some food, he's starving here. Uh, thinks the soldier is dead, but still alive. And he's so afraid that he just reacts and kills him. And um, realizes, finds out later when the, this uh, military unit arrives that it's actually his father. Um, limit, limiting his ability to eat. Since then, I've never eaten to satisfaction. I have a child sized stomach. As he taunts Joe for his gustatory excesses, it becomes clear that Kim feeds on the poorly mediated weight loss, the hunger of his opponents. This alone may be the fatal flaw disqualifying him from representing an empire. While Kim aspires to win the world crown, his ability to do so is insufficient. Unlike Joe, Kim doesn't grow. Deriving his power from childhood trauma, his strength is his weakness. He is forever caught in the past in a continuous loop of repentance. While it might seem that Joe's victory over Kim derives from his ability to bleed profusely, Kim is shocked by the sight of blood. He reveals in the end that he won by channeling this, the strength of uh, Riki Ishii. He doesn't need a steak. That's Riki Ishii. Uh, not only, yeah, realizing that Riki Ishii not only didn't eat, he didn't drink. The contest for world do domination seems determined here by his capacity for self-deprivation. It is worth noting here that at the time of Reiki Ishii's death in the manga, he was so popular that an actual funeral was held for him at the offices of the publisher, and this is the invitation. According to Stephen Bridgley, Kodansha's editorial division was flooded with consolation letters, funeral flowers, and even gifts of money following the death of Riki Ishii on the pages of Shonen Magazine. The organizers had planned for 500, but over 700 people uh, attended to watch an actual Buddhist priest perform the death rite and to see the Tokyo Kid Brothers reenact the faithful bow. As Ridgely states, the novelist Terayama, Terayama Shuji's engagement in the project helped demonstrate that, quote, the path between imagination and reality is not a unidirectional flow in which real events are filtered through consciousness and reworked into fictional texts. This is fiction moving concretely into the real and life integrating more than imitating art. Could the same perhaps be said for empire? In Kim, Joe struggled with a formidable 
formidable opposite. For his next challenge, he is forced by his promoter, Yoko Shiraki, who delegates the search for his opponent in Southeast Asia to her corporate staff to collide with a hyperbolic version of himself and the beast-like wild energy he has relied upon to overcome most of his opponents. They locate this primordial warrior, Harimau, in Malaysia. The visceral discrepancies between Joe's body and Harimau's incredible physical prowess correspond directly with the imperial Japanese colonial interest in Malaysia as a land rich in natural resources essential to the Japanese war effort, petroleum, rubber, tin, natural resources so conspicuously absent from Japanese soil. Harimau's athletic abilities exceed Joe's in every way. Known for his reach, Joe cannot hope to uh, Joe cannot hope to rely on his long arms when confronted with Harimau's, which nearly drag the ground. Furthermore, Harimau employs unorthodox techniques in using his animal-like physical abilities to take advantage of the gray zones and gnomic loopholes of the sport, eventually going beyond all boundaries. The first such occurs when he escapes from attack by jumping on the ropes. As the astonished commentator states, rule book in hand, if you go outside the ring or onto the apron, you will be disqualified, but it doesn't say anything about standing on the ropes. The only part of his body within reach is his legs, but if his opponent hits him there, he will be disqualified. Other examples include the ceiling punch, where he jumps up very high and comes down. Uh, the rope propulsion jumps, jumping across each edge of the ring. The flipping double uppercut, which is then shown in slow motion. And when Joe finds a way to best tiring mouth, he retaliates with every foul in the book, including face stomping and biting. While Harry Mao's performance attests to the notion that the boxing ring functions as a tiny square of extraterritoriality, inside of which the rule of law does not apply, Joe's refusal to win by disqualification stands as a powerful appeal to the superiority of sportsmanship, chivalry, and other concepts related to a certain notion of civilized behavior. While emphasis on Harry Mao's darkness, facial features, hunched over posture, etc., reflects suspiciously Western, Japanese racial prejudices, prejudices at their worst, including his infantilization as a uh, <clears throat> product of Pavlovian conditioning, rewarded, distracted, and controlled by dispersal of chocolate bars. What makes perhaps the biggest impression in the episode are the scenes of Harry Mouse recruitment, exploitation, and dehumanization at the hands of the English journalist who discovers and trains them. Laced with comedy, they deeply call into reflection the competing imperial projects of Japan and the British Empire. Such violations bring to mind John Dower's criticism of the less than human treatment and abandonment of colonial forces from India under British command and overrun in the, in the Pacific Theater, all but lending credence to the rhetoric of the greater East Asian coast prosperity sphere that Japanese colonized Asia to protect and educate its inhabitants just as they would Japanese while Western colonial forces sought only to subjugate and exploit. The manga's take is most subtly expressed upon the arrival in Japan of the Malaysian jungle warrior. Quote, unfortunately, this coach was not able to come. He's been laid up in the hospital for a long time after being punched out by Harima. Uh, another point I wanted to mention is that it's not simply the work is not simply an allegory, but there's evidence of it being a Romana club. Uh, Shirak Yoko being a representation of Nagano, Nagano Haru. Here are just a few examples. Mr. Yonakura, Mr. Yokokura, uh, Colonel Young's Major League, and Taken, actually, the Chinese characters meaning, meaning Empire of the Fist represented the Shiraki boxing globe. When one considers how pervasive the influence of manga was throughout Japanese popular culture at the time of its release, it is not difficult to imagine a generation or two naming their children after Joe Yabuki. Still, what is the statistical likelihood that any one of his namesakes would grow up to be him? 
If the line between fiction and reality blurred in 1970 with the funeral of Riki Ishii, it all but disintegrated when Joichiro Tatsuyoshi, a living instantiation of his comic precursor, recolonized the Japanese imagination through his emergence and progression from the national to world champion in 1989 to 1991. The timing was impeccable as the manga provided a hero for the late 60s. The world followed suit by bringing him into existence at the height of the bubble economy. With Japan's reemergence as a formidable economic empire, its auto and electronics industries, acquisition of Rockefeller Center, etc., posing a legitimate threat to that of the U.S., it seems no accident that Tatsuyoshi won the world title from an American Greg Richardson. And they have all these similarities, both like imitated or environmental and genetic. Uh, as Ridgely elaborates, the reality of boxing may have something to do with this mixture of real and fictional elements, and it may appeal to fans and others because it parallels the mixture of direct and imagined events within our everyday experience. The miraculous sense to conclude that the popular imagination of Joe Yabuki converged with economic, cultural, and political circumstances to produce a real Joe in the world who went on to global martial conquest may suggest at least one form for the endurance of empire. That said, considering the outcome of Yabuki's world title challenge, perhaps Tatsuyoshi went too far. From an imperial standpoint, Yabuki was much more original. He lost. In challenging the world, he depleted both the representative of its dominant empire, Jose Mendoza, and himself with great satisfaction opening up amidst at least a momentary end to the cycle of force, a space for contemplation, a smile on his face, without conquering anything but the desire for dominance and so <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you a lot for that uh, fascinating insight, and I'm glad to say even the British imperialism uh, got a look in on this one. <laughs> Not to be missed at it on any occasion. Uh, thanks. So we're going to move uh, along the program. So Marco now on Oriental Despotism. Well, thank, first of all, uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. I want to give, begin by giving my thanks. I'm here because of, uh, of, of a certain amount of publications that the Tedos published, and I'm very thankful to uh, Russell who published them. And in particular, that one of them is being discussed now and will be probably uh, be the, at the center of the debate of a, a, of, a, of a meeting that will be taken in the Italian parliament in, in November. And so Telos, the name of Telos is beginning to <laughs> try to spread it around. And um, um, so, uh, my, and of course, uh, my, my pieces are all about Europe, about the crisis of the European Union. And the subject that I'm discussing this morning is not directly tied to that, but as I will try to say, it, it is tied to that because at the end, if I have time, I'll say a few things about what it means this problem of the European Union, how to solve it. <coughs> so you, uh, somebody, I have at least three reasons for choosing this idea of discussing Oriental despotism. The first reason is that we have a feeling in Europe of being encircled by non-friends. I mean, Russia, Turkey, and China are very important players in the world, but they are uh, not have nothing to do with our system, political institutional system, and our mode of living. So, uh, I will try to sort of say a few things about these these countries. And, and about the origins of the Oriental despotism. But I will begin by saying that the real uh, criticism is, uh, is the fact that these, the, the, second, of the second reason for choosing this is to introduce people like uh, Big Vogel, like Marx, like Montesquieu, who discuss this problem of Oriental despotism. But the third reason is this fact that in all of these countries, they there is no opposite. They don't like opposition. They hate opposition. We, on the Westerners, we just love opposition. We, we, the Western wouldn't have achieved anything that it has, has achieved without the opposition. So, 
opposition means criticism, it means challenge, it means tolerance, it means investigation, it means knowledge, knowledge of the market and all the all the all the truth and all the problems that come out of the market system. A market system which is blocked in the Eastern East Europe for years and years and years. Um, this this team has been discussed, has been discussed for centuries. I mean, the, the, the traces of this is in George Stuart Mill, in Tocqueville, and but the most, the most relevant are here, are Montesquieu, are Marx, and Marx, and Wittfogel. I'll begin with, with, the, with Montesquieu. Montesquieu identifies in the Spiegel why he says, talks very at length about despotism. And I mean, I won't give you sort of a long thing about what Montesquieu said, but there's one word which which is the key to understand what he means. Fear, factory. The principle on which despotism is based is fear. It's fear of liberty, fear of talk, fear of press, and all that. And uh, this, this problem of fear, you can, you can put it next to another idea of fear, which was introduced in the 1930s by an Italian historian called Guglielmo Ferrero, who taught, by the way, Princeton during the in the 20s and the 1930s. Guglielmo eh? uh, Federico recounts the, the story of Luciano Bonaparte, who had encircled the, the Assemblée Nationale, from which Napoleon came out as the first consul with more power than any king in France had ever enjoyed. You know what, right? And Luciano was furious with Napoleon because Luciano Bonaparte was a sort of an idealist. And he, he and Napoleon had immediately suppressed the free press, and the channel was cleared. And Napoleon answered, he said, if I leave freedom to the press, I won't last in power for a month. So this is the thing. So as uh, one can realize how touchy all these despotists are about, about, uh, about free press, about criticism, and about opposition. Okay, Montesquieu. Then, uh, the example, another, another author that discusses this very briefly but very uh, effectively <laughs> is Marx. Marx, in two famous letters to the Zapiskis, the Zapiskis were uh, uh, publishers in, in St. Petersburg, uh, uh, and in one of these letters, uh, Marx says, uh, he, 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 he announces his preoccupation if the manifesto of the Communist Party should take fire in Russia. And he says, quote, it would be the restoration of Oriental despotism. This, of course, these letters have been immediately hidden by Lenin. Uh, Vera Zazovic had a part in this story. They kept them, they only emerged in the 50s. And Bitfog and then Brunovici and others, um, including our friend Luciano Pellicani, Adam. <laughs> <coughs> uh, wrote all about all, uh, much about this subject, but the most interesting of all, author of all about the uh, rental despotism is Wittfogel. Karl Wittfogel is a repentant Marxist who belonged in the to the, uh, to the uh, Frankfurt uh, Adorno of Canada and all those. In the in the in the uh, in the fifties, he wrote this monumental work on Oriental despotism. And he has invented this this image of the hydraulic uh, despot. The hydraulic despot controls the, the locks, the the irrigation locks. Therefore, he controls agriculture. He controls food. <laughs> he controls the market. And so, so he has he has all the power. And uh, he's absolutely intolerant. He can't move from the, from, from his uh, prison of power. And uh, strangely enough, uh, the Americans have experienced an example of this during the White Revolution, Kennedy's White Revolution in Iran. In the 1960s, uh, <coughs> early 60s, uh, there was an enormous uh, project, agricultural project, financed by the World Bank in Iran. And uh, an army of agriculturists from Tennessee, from Indiana, traveled to Iran. And they reorganized and they, they constructed an incredible network of it. Well, at the end, something happened. 
but the, the, but the project failed <laughs> because the Mullah, the Mullah, the people didn't want to open up the, 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 the locks. So in fact, the, their power, the, 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 the water power on the water was uh, practically the, the, the key of their, of their authority. Okay. The three countries that speaking, going back to the theme of empire, the three countries that have, uh, I would say, a knack for empire, Russia, China, and uh, Turkey, uh, uh, <coughs> as I was saying, along, along this knack, uh, uh, apart from the various prerogatives of this knack, there is, there is this hatred for the opposition. And so, in fact, uh, all, in spite of the fact that somebody like Putin uh, I mean, Russia is not an empire anymore, right? The Soviet uh, Russia was an empire. It was a double empire. It was a, it was a territorial empire in the classic sense, and it was an ideological empire. It didn't have to be spread out territorially. All it had to do is use the 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 the, the, uh, the Troy, how do you call it? Troy, 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 Trojan horses in the, the communist parties around around the world. To, to, to impose uh, a, a, a fashion, a political system, and all that. Uh, but uh, in spite of this, uh, and in spite of the qualities of Mr. Putin, I think he would have been absolutely exceptional. If I had been a Russian in, after the fall of, uh, of 89, I, I mean, I would have been very worried because, I mean, you know, they lost the houses, they lost the work, they lost the entire system came, came to pieces. And Putin sort of saved a little bit of the thing. However, his system of government is still despot, despotic, <laughs> despotic. And uh, he's a very able, and he's trying to make friends. And in, in, in fact, in this particular moment, he's not a friend. But he's, a, he's a friend of whom I consider not friends, like uh, Marion Le Pen, like uh, Salvini, like the Visegrad countries, the Poles and the, all the Eastern Europeans. They are trying to to, 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 to to put the European uh, Union in shambles, or maybe to penetrate the European Union and turn it into something into something different, which we, we might not like. But precisely, precisely for the reason that I was saying about despotism, about opposition, and in, already in the European Union we have this legitimacy problem. The opposition, do you know anything about the, the opposition in the inside the Commission? It's not very insignificant, very insignificant, as I would say later if I have if I have the time. Anyway, uh, uh, Russia. Then there are certain moves of, of, in, that happens in Russia. One of which really surprised me enormously. I read on a Catholic uh, paper last year. Uh, it was only the only paper that published it that the uh, the uh, the choir of the Red Guards, the Russian Red Guards in their shimmering uniforms and medals and everything, uh, uh, arrived at the Vatican to sing uh, 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 on the occasion of the beatification of John Paul II. Can you believe something like that? Was oh, that absolutely very astonished by, by a fact like that? And uh, at the, at two weeks after, it was a, the, the, the Patriarch of Moscow summoned all the priests, in, in the Russian priests, to for the anniversary of the of the thousandth year from the the schism, the, the schism from the from the church of from the church of Rome, which was later in fact, but there, there were many schisms. So, uh, so uh, Russia uh, now, so Russia has the. As I was saying, I mean, in spite of, 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 of the qualities of Mr. Putin, Putin remains, the system remains despotic, and I don't like this mix of uh, another, another American, Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon is causing this great movement in Paris, which is, this, and, and uh, Steve Bannon, I don't know what people think of Steve Bannon, I don't think much of Steve Bannon. And I don't think he's the right person to do any movement about anything anyway. Sorry? Two minutes? Left? Okay, China. <laughs> a few things about China. Uh, China has an enormous uh, potential. 
I will say two good things about China. Uh, the two good things about China that China, since the time of the, of the Queen, have, are very professional. Uh, no, no mayor of a small village can be boast without having undergone a number of exams. They're fi they have a fixation about exams. Exams, exams all the time. Uh, for instance, according to the Chinese system, somebody like Sardini, Di Maio, Trump, they couldn't be in the boat because they haven't got a... <laughs> <laughs> They're incompetent in other words. This is the, this is the thing. And, um, uh, and China's had, a, I'll finish this China, but, uh, China's had a, 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 an important mixed uh, tie with Italy because the, 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 uh, the last year a number of scholars who arrived in Rome at the Institute for Geographic Studies which has a fantastic archive. So they went there, of course, supposedly to, to study all the explorers and the, the went to China in the 17th, the 17th, 16th, 17th century, after Matteo Ricci and all those, you know. And um, then, but then while they were there in the afternoon, the president told me, they were going, they were studying Iri, Iri Istituto per la Ricostruzione Industriale, which is a, was a public holding, which was created by Mussolini, but then it continued. And the public, and the Iri was the instrument the public instrument, the public holding that allowed uh, the entire reconstruction of Italy during the war, autostrads and hospitals and banks and all that, that really gradually uh, uh, dissolves into, into private public uh, system. Of course, Gizzi was a source of, of enormous amount of money and some uh, uh, enormous amount of corruption, but it was anyway, it was an opposition. It was, it was lots of communist socialists. I mean, it was a Observing. The Chinese have adopted exactly this system. All this private new business in China, they have a hand always of, of a very elastic hand. I understand uh, of the of the of the state uh, of the Communist Party inside the thing. So this allows them to move around and to uh, and to uh, extend their capacity. Today, I'll finish the extension empire doesn't necessarily go by by territory or by space spatial. It goes by banks. Going back to Russia, Cyprus, the banks of Cyprus have about uh, 10 times more Russian money than the, the entire GOP of, of Cyprus. So the, 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 the mass of, 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 of money that goes around the world is something absolutely immense. And today, China buys 25% of Goldman Sachs. And with Goldman Sachs, they can buy industries, they can finance whatever they want. And uh, so we have to hope that the, uh, that the Chinese, uh, who are the only empire that have all the characteristics of the, uh, ancient empires, still they can continue. I would like to say something how this fits with the European Union. But maybe later on we can come out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am so grateful to be here. <clears throat> Far from exhibiting a supposed secularizing absence of quests for divine salvation, <laughs> modernity has been replete with messianic pursuits. Some of these missions have envisioned the creation of worldly utopias, <laughs> ranging from perfectible political economic orders to deliverance through apotheosized technologies. Some seek transcendent deliverance beyond terrestrial history's apocalyptic end, and some conflate transcendence with imminence as invariants of religious nationalism. Akin to debates <clears throat> over whether we have now entered a post-secular age, commentators have asked if a pervasive return of religion is augured by the recent surge in interest in modern manifestations of messianism. This interest is characterized by extensive engagement with and application of such 20th century figures as the sometimes sparring, not least, over the implications of Zionist messianism, <coughs> German-born triumvirate of Benjamin, Scholem, and Taubus, along with a post-structuralist atheologian like Derrida. Also showing forth are variegated global embodiments, <laughs> ranging from United States global missionizing, together with its erstwhile Soviet and now recrudescent Russian Orthodox ideological and geostrategic counterweight, 
to Sunni as well as Shi'i Islamic salvational aspirations and their creedal offshoots, for example, the Baha'i Faith, and the Hindu supremacism emblematized by Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Beyond religio-political projects, the imbuing of Silicon Valley's high priests with the potency to create omniscient algorithms and escape hatches from planetary destruction, whether aboard rockets or via post-human transmutations, echoes the Baconian endeavor of scientifically restoring the lapsed humankind to Eden, with human cognition <laughs> becoming the source of ultimate knowledge. The overriding point that messianism, as with religion itself, cannot today be resurgent if it never went away, serves further to underscore the irresolvable tensions between modernist messianism and questions of temporality and history. Modernity is the form of historical self-consciousness purporting to have achieved a definitive, forward-thrusting rupture from the past. Yet, its progressional promises of salvation remain ineluctably bound with what Norman Cohn termed the ancient roots of such apocalyptic faiths as U.S. millenarianism and Marxism-Leninism. Redolent of dualistic Zoroastrianism and the prophetic traditions that it profoundly influenced, modernity's professed divine saviors variously seek to redeem a purported, dark, disordered epic of history by seizing a cyclical, some would, not, would no doubt say cynical, opportunity to remold the past as a golden template for a perfect future that remains ever perspective and out of reach. When viewed in this light, contemporary instantiations of the politics of nostalgia exemplify our enduring messianic age. This brings us, likewise, to the endurance of empire. Empire has served as an internally diverse form of vehicle for expressing and legitimating modern messianism from, for example, the civilizing missions or proselytizing liberalism of France, Britain, the US, and post-Cold War humanitarian interventionists, to liberalism's Bolshevik and Nazi antagonists, to the globalizing matrix of capitalist governmentality evoked by Hart and Negri. Moreover, such empires have variously sought to impose their salvational renderings of modernity through the disciplinary implements of techno-scientific instrumentalism. Discipline being meant in every connotation, from physical force to academic knowledges that are presumed authoritative. In this fashion, modernity's manifold cognitive pretense to light the way toward final truth is expressed through the converging modernist tendency to imperially control. This control is sought not merely through the extension of political dominance, but by means of a thoroughgoing sovereignty over minds and, and worldly reality, whose absolute will is presumed to be consecrated by that mantle of final truth. As articulated by Wael Halam in his new exposition of modernity's inhering colonial logic, just as there is political sovereignty, so there is epistemic sovereignty, a parent of all other forms of sovereignty. Further demonstrating the ongoing modern conjunction between messianism and empire, is how modernity's imperial impulse manifests in dominant powers contending ambitions to seize hold of time and history, forging through fires to redeem the past within a future realm of restored glories. The last hundred years <clears throat> seem chronologically bookended by a global array of instances, from, say, making the world safe for Wilsonian democracy, to President Xi Jinping's holding forth a re-envisioned Silk Road as the belt on which global peace and prosperity will run. Yet, just as, his just as history stubbornly refused to reach a triumphal denouement after 1989, that which Sholem intimated as the perpetual deferment of messianic arrival. And of course, Sholem was making specific reference to the Judaic experience, but it portends broader resonances, I would argue. So the perpetual deferment of messianic arrival signifies a paradox 
from which modernity's imperially born salvational claims in their various worldwide inflections cannot extricate themselves. <clears throat> On the one hand, the ambition of ceaseless hegemonic dominance, as far as the eye can see, propagandistically depicts itself in self-perpetuating messianic terms. On the other hand, modern empire's asserted messianic powers remain, as the mystically tinged historical materialist Benjamin understood, too weak to really control the unknowable path of history. Under such circumstances, how can ultimate salvation be allowed, let alone compelled? to enter through what Benjamin referred to as the straight gate of time. Now, it may be insufficient to reduce to political sovereignty alone the overarching modern posture of colonial sovereignty, vis-a-vis -vis knowledge, nature, and human subjectivity that what El Halak regards as being vastly more transformative than simply the sort of domination characterizing the way that political empires ruled over subjects, especially the conquered. Nonetheless, modern statehood is the portal into the paradox of messianic imperialism. Encompassed thereby are the colonial dynamics through which state sovereignty's internal architecture of dominance coheres and has been globally propagated outward from Europe as the forcible carrier of both modernist mentalities and the international order's theoretical and institutional foundations. Recall once again the winter of 1918-1919, when aspiring Asian and African nationalists, following their initial flourish of inspiration while hearing President Wilson's messianic call for worldwide self-determination, soon realized that nationhood had not in fact vanquished empire. So too are we reminded at present that the late modern narrative of an emancipatory decolonizing passage from empire to nation is quite illusory. Modernist empires have characteristically traveled in distinct ideological species, including such nationalisms as those of France, Britain, and the US, under the covert banner of spreading reason and science to the benighted so as to civilize and enlighten rather than subjugate. However, today, there are proudly unapologetic exhortations for imperial re-rescue from the alleged world disorder that has been fed by a surfeit of post-World post War I nation states together with the ongoing imperial duplicity accompanying the creation and strategic manipulation of those states. A case in point is the neo ottomanism of Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. On President Erdogan's view, this Western imperial duplicity, this imperial duplicity is rather uniquely Western, as of late American, and the pan-Turkic nationalism promising to animate a salvational, counter-hegemonic response is unimpeachable. Now, as for the patent instance, where the aggressive reinvigoration of state sovereignty might alternatively seem to go by the name of an inward-looking nationalist isolationism, that of the White House's present occupant, President Trump has been bequeathed a singular apparatus of global surveillance and multidimensional violence whose deep-seated hegemonic impulse merely trends in his tweeting hands toward peculiar targets. Perhaps the chief such target, the Islamic Republic of Iran, is no less a full participant in the imperially suffused dynamics of modern global politics particularly insofar as its messianically encoded regional rivalries with Saudi Arabia and Israel are concerned, notwithstanding Iranian demurrals that Persia's own great empires are long gone, leaving today's imperial subjects to actually be championed in their resistance by Tehran. The modern concept of state sovereignty running genealogically through Hobbes and Schmidt amply demonstrates that from the standpoint of that concept of sovereignty, the sovereign will alone holds the absolute limitless power to save us from a worldly destruction whose final aftermath we cannot know. Hence, 
we are ceaselessly subject to a political sovereign who keeps us in perpetual purgatorial limbo. Where the messianic imperialism incipient in state sovereignty is concerned, Schmidt is further suggestive in the nomos of the earth. On Schmidt's explanation, the empire of the Christian European Middle Ages, generatively preceding the modern international legal order, was predicated on, quote, the decisive historical concept of the restrainer, the catacomb. While this Christian empire grasped its own mortality, and I once again quote Schmidt, empire's historical mandate was to perpetuate its dominance indefinitely by restraining the appearance of the Antichrist and the end of the present eon. Now, the catacomb idea is directly pertinent to imperial Russian messianism, self-depiction as the Third Rome that shields against the Antichrist. But beyond this, there are abundant resonances elsewhere, as the driving existential antagonism of the political endures across the spatio-temporal transformations, remaking post-medieval world politics through and beyond present efforts at withholding the apocalypse by expanding one's own hegemony. But when the end comes and there is nothing more to be done, politics' salvational conceit is re revealed to be just that, conceit. The antagonistic conception of politics, implicitly purporting to offer salvation through empire, including the self-denying liberal humanitarian imperialism for which Schmidt had such withering scorn, represents only the leading edge of what Italian philosopher Federico Campagna terms the endless war on the world waged by the regime of Technic. Technic describes a hegemonic modern cosmogony construing the universe as being ceaselessly subject to quantifying modes of cognitive and instrumental mastery. From the, object, from the ontological objectification of the universe to the construction of dangerous, colonizable others through the aid of officially sanctioned bodies of knowledge to today's self-proliferating hostilities of identity politics. Frames are established for a worldview wherein it is presupposed that we can engineer and extend our saving sovereignty over the one or the ones who would dominate us. <clears throat> but in order to justify the pursuit of salvation, there must be created an adversary to restrain, and against whom to depict oneself as defending ad infinitum. However, is this really a modern paradox? Or are we perceiving something that is endemic to the human search for meaning, purpose, and security? As intimated, say, no less in Thucydides' accounts of what transpired a few miles from here than by anyone more recent. What is modern is the chimerical belief that we can seize and solve the paradox, as if it were a mathematical equation. But neither the managerial expert who claims to rationalist, rationalistically deliver the true good of humanity, nor the populace who tars the expert as the enemy while concocting chaos that supposedly only he can fix, can actually deliver salvation through the self-restricting confines, however expansionist, of worldly power. If we are to be saved, we cannot know nor say what it will take. But relinquishing the hubristic notion that we can impose a true virtuous order on the entropic drift of untamable reality might be a place to begin. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, and thanks for sticking to time. I could see that the pages were coming to the end, so I didn't intervene, so that's great. Okay. Thanks so much for all the speakers. Uh, we really have uh, a common. So uh, we might as well get started straight away. I'm wondering, uh, though, with Andrew's talk about uh, the continuation of messianism, uh, that was kind of my critique listening to uh, your paper, Marco, of the 
the fact that we love opposition, say, in the West. Um, my feeling is that we do have clear ideas of sacred and profane, namely things like individual choice, rationality, uh, and we tend to uh, perceive as less or backward or even hate uh, cultures that fail to uphold those kind of values. So there is always this threat of the outside, and, and, and there are people that can't be included. But that, that's my feeling, and I'm just wondering your take on that. Maybe a brief response. Maybe a just one, one sentence sent by Gladstone discussing with the Prussian prince. Uh, the discussions about exactly uh, about opposition, and he said his crack was even savages have, have a chief, but only Her Majesty has a chief of the opposition. You see. So he will say this proudly because the opposition in a country, being in, in, in a political system, means criticism, it means progress, it means uh, um, knowledge, it means all sorts of things. And we would be not, we, we wouldn't be what we are in the West without the opposition. Uh, so and the, and the, the messianic aspect, of course, is that there's no there's a, there's a revealed truth. And we have fought against this for centuries, against the state and the empire. And we have stayed, we've done, we've fought this not only here, but even in China. In China, the, 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 the Protestants and people like Rawlinson and the people of the Protestants fought against the, the, the thing. And there was, a, there was a Pope Pius X in Rome, which was sticking to the. So, I mean, opposition is absolutely fundamental. And this is the difference that marks them our world to this other world, this other coming world, which I see coming, in fact. I see coming in a world without an opposition. And I don't like it. <laughs> Just a quick question about opposition and effect, but to Warren, uh, what you have presented, it seems incredibly masculine. And again, I don't let you ref on this because I know you, you, you've thought about it very deeply and all that. I'm just wondering, are there in the audiences for the manga some uh, hooks through which women can identify or understand maybe even the, the nourishment aspects? I mean, something that's, that's obvious? Or is it meant to, uh, in effect, define uh, the uh, empire-related concepts of primarily in, in masculine, or perhaps, I, I apologize for the term, homoerotic uh, concept, uh, notions. Uh, there's some, I guess, a genre division between this would fall under shonen and uh, shoujo, manga for boys and manga for girls. So, uh, I guess that's one thing to keep in mind, but that the issue of uh, hunger, I think, was now whenever people who don't have any uh, real interest or knowledge in boxing and try and talk about it, that's the first yeah. thing they talk about. Exactly. It's, it's not about that. Um, and Terayama talks about there's a shift from like, anger against your opponent. There, now there's no more discussion of the sentiment or just are you. Uh, um, are you prepared to make the way? It's all about it. That's the question. First, Marco, I, I follow the logic of your, your argument and I appreciate your um, your panegyric to, uh, to opposition. It's about the productivity of negativity. But I think that um, it's wrong to say that there's no opposition in Turkey, in Russia, in China, in Iran. On the contrary, I think those oppositional forces are probably more robust than the oppositional forces in the United States or in the West, where, where kind of cultural conformism prevails. I mean, there are heroic people in the jails of, uh, of, uh, of, of Ankara and, 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 and Tehran. This is the real opposition, uh, as opposed to sort of the academic fluff we get in the, in the West. So that's, that, that, that's I mean, you know, people put their lives at this at stake in those countries, and, and here it's a matter of CVs. Uh, the, um, uh, um, Andrew, I appreciated the um, entropic drift. Huh? Yes. Uh, but it raises the question of, aren't we really talking about existential needs for, I'll call it, governments? Uh, and we live in a rhetorical world where empire is um, a priori denounced. 
Um, I think what we denounce it for is this association with domination and brutality. But I don't think empires are worse than nation states on this at all. But this is maybe a feature of, of governance, and sometimes it's done poorly, sometimes it's done well. But gee, the um, probably the Habsburg Empire, the Ottoman Empire were more tolerant than most of their successor states. Uh, now that's not a defense of those empires, but I think it's a call for us to be cautious about a kind of knee-jerk anti-imperialism, which is just just sort of watered down common term problem. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to answer Russ. Uh, you're right, of course there is an opposition in Turkey. Only it is, it is that all, most of the institutional opposition is in jail. Yeah. I mean, Erdogan was, was, was elected in a, not a landslide election, but I mean, he came in an enormous amount with 169 journalists of the opposition in jail. So, so I, I call that no opposition. So institutional opposition. This is why I was quoting the uh, the, the Gladstone and His Majesty's loyal opposition in Parliament. Institution. If, if you protest against anything about China, China will be talk immediately. The Dalai Lama cannot be invited to the to, to the Vatican because otherwise he he would the the, the Chinese government would sort of. Uh, uh, chuck out a, a number of Catholics, and the growing Catholics in China is growing, growing, growing enormously. And so they're afraid because of fear. The, these despotic countries are afraid of everything. And in Russia, in China, and in Turkey, they are afraid. This fear is the is the, is the lever that moves them the, the, the world. And so the opposition means that there is an institutional opposition is part of the game. The opposition. So this is why we love opposition. Because we've lived, we have lived with the opposition. We can move from right to left according to how flexible the situation becomes. But we must know that there is, we have the right to be opposed, opposed to whatever is going on. So. <laughs> Russell, thank you so much for your critique. And there's a lot to engage with in there. And I guess, it, it, to me, the well, sort of the other to the fluff anti-imperialism, and I, I very much take your point on that, is this kind of unapologetic turn to imperialism. <laughs> Again, Erdogan being a kind of case in point, as you know, for people who say, well, the only way to guard against this entropic drift now is to reimpose some kind of order that we look back to nostalgically. And that, in a sense, I almost see that as a validation of, of your point. The implicit view for someone like Erdogan that, hey, it's 1918 to 1923 when all this trouble started, when you know uh, nefarious Western colonialists imposing Westphalian-style states as an artificial construct messed up this good thing we had going since 1289. And that is, is something that I find really, really fascinating here. Another uh, thing that I have in mind in thinking about your point, and, and Wayne very usefully mentioned Krishan Kumar's new book yesterday. And what's interesting about Kumar's new book, Visions of Empire, is I think you can actually read it as a kind of respectable intellectual attempt at offering a defense of empire in this disordered early 21st century world. So it's not just the Xi's, the Putins, the Erdogan's, the Trumps, if one wishes to view any of those people as recrudescent, unapologetic imperialists, it's respectable intellectuals as well. And I think that, again, quote, end quote, and I think in a sense that peculiar current phenomenon coming on the heels of a couple of decades ago when you would have been laughed out of a room or shouted and hounded out of a room if you had, had issued an apologia for empire, I mean, that says a lot about how people are perceiving the entropy of the world. And just one more, more quick thing, when you mentioned entropy yesterday, of course, it was you know, inspiring and thinking of what I want to do in here. And I found myself thinking, vis-a-vis -vis the universal in particular, whether the, you know, the human wish to stanch entropy, to somehow get a hold of it, is that a sort of anthropo anthropological human impulse, or is it one that's inevitably culturally conditioned? And I kind of already took from some of the comments yesterday, and I guess I would quite agree, that maybe a characteristic of the Western tradition, quote, end quote, or the modern West, quote, end quote, is to have the hubristic 
presumption that we are capable of stanching entropy when in fact, as an existential matter, I guess I would argue that we are not. Entropy is a natural condition. One sentence for the final question. Sure. I guess I would describe Erdogan's behavior as a kind of Turkish nationalism rather than Ottoman imperialism, and trying to figure out that difference is crucial. That's a great point, and I quite agree, and yet just one, not a rejoinder, but just, I think, consonant with your point, goes back again to something Wayne was saying, this supposed distinction between empire and nation that has become this modern, this myth of modern politics in the past century or two or whatever, is shown by the example of Erdogan, arguably, to be completely non-existent. As nation collapses into empire, empire collapses into nation, we can't tell where the distinctions lie, what one might argue, I think. Because I completely agree with you about Erdogan, but it's a sort of Mobius script, where the Turkish nationalism becomes the neo-Ottomanism, and, and so forth. Just one the bibliographical point, Dominic Levin, 15, 20 years ago, I think, first made this point of an academic rehabilitation of empire as a political community with certain positive goods, obviously based on the Russian experience with the nation state form, mm -hmm. is not naturally comfortable in the vast Russian landmass. Mm -hmm. So just to say, I think Christian Kuma is picking up on that later. Yeah, yeah. 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 that is. Yeah, uh, uh, points for Lauren and Mark. Uh, for Lauren, the uh, first thing that came to mind is G.I. Joe. And, and Joe, uh, just the term Joe is so excessive. Uh, the you know the, the father of the savior two two thousand years ago you know Joseph uh, Nazareth and so forth uh, the, the, the premier Joe of the Soviet Union would be Joe Stalin uh, for its uh, <laughs> yeah it's that word uh, uh, and uh, just the whole concept of and and. And look who is uh, lauding uh, uh, John McCain. It's Joe Biden, uh, the sort of the uh, ultimate uh, avuncular uh, figure, you know, uh, kind of like G.I. Joe is the ultimate uh, soldier during World War II or something like that. Uh, so uh, for you, I have Joe, and, and, and respond to that in terms of the Joe you. Uh, in, in, Comparison to these other shows. Uh, for Marco, uh, I'm thinking that what you hold, you will lose. What you hold too closely, you will lose, like the, uh, uh, the T tax in, in the American Revolution. You know, the, the trying to hold on to the colonies too tightly, you lost them. Like the uh, Chinese in 900, uh, the the interior forces won out over the exterior forces, or we might have had a world exploration 500 years sooner than uh, Christopher Columbus and, and the, the rest of the uh, Portuguese and uh, Spanish explorers that uh, opened up the world 500 years later. Uh, could have come out of China instead, but, but the interior people won out, and not the uh, not the merchant class and so forth. So holding on, you lose, uh, is the concept uh, that I want you to respond to and explore. Those are your two. Thank you. Yeah, that oh, was fascinating a question for me. because, uh, And I asked a Japanese friend, what is what is the nuance, or what is the sense of good? Thinking, is it something like an everyman? He said, no, quite the opposite. It's a, it's a, um, it's a very exotic you know, was for and to have it written on a trunks or on a car in a cursive English only accentuates that further. And then if you look at the Chinese character that represents Joe, first of all, the uh, Tatsuyoshi, the real boxer, people think is like the messianic incarnation of, of Joe Yabuki in the manga. His father named him after uh, the manga character. The, that character has a, a connotation of uh, durability, or strength. But if the father has added a stroke, it doesn't exist to the character in, in Japanese. So it's, I don't know, it's a kind of further, another kind of personalization of exoticization. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Well, I'm not. I'm not so, so sure that I, I that I that I want to stick. That I don't want to stick to the to the to the, to the, to the principles that we like, that we enjoy, and we have. And they have given uh, uh, welfare and uh, the best possible uh, life for millions of people. So we. Uh, I'm very defensive of the Western uh, pattern of, uh, of political institutions. And uh, these institutions have cost an enormous amount of work and, uh, in the laws, and we have transmitted the Roman law into the, the monasteries, and the monasteries have to little by little have, have uh, translated, have transported the two in most important uh, her in heritage of human being, Roman law and, th and Greek philosophy. It was transmitted through the monasteries. In, 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 in Europe. And this has resulted in a conflict of all sorts of things. But this kind of world is the, the world we belong to. And this is the sort of world that, that everybody seems to like. Even everybody wants to, I mean, in Europe, everybody wants to be European. The, the Africans want to be European. Even 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 Erdogan wants to come to the European Union, although nobody wants him, of course, because Erdogan is, 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 is a. Is a uh, despot, so no, I have no doubt about this, and uh, he crushes opposition, and these people crush opposition, they crush, in other words, directly, they crush the, the, the argument, the, the field of argumentation, and, and so this is, which, which we have lived on for, for centuries, and so, okay. Uh, we're coming up to, uh, <laughs> we're, we're coming up to coffee time, but I think we can go up another five minutes because I think there's another few points. So we'll take them all together and maybe then we have a few responses. So, uh, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I enjoyed it very much, uh, especially yours, uh, uh, Andrew. That's uh, it, it, it speaks uh, very to what I was talking about yesterday. Uh, I have a very short, uh, I think. Two discourses that are uh, that have been coming up uh, for the last uh, generations. I think maybe might uh, speak into your point. And, and one is uh, the revival of the just war uh, in, uh, in, 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 in accordance with the Iraq war. I mean, a lot of uh, people just suddenly revitalized the medieval thinking and just war. And the other one is the, uh, the, the discourse on the securitization of time uh, and, and the new discourse on the Anthropocene. And I, I wonder, it, it's not a question about is uh, climate change real or not real, it's a question of how it can be used in, uh, in the way of imposing the control and, and other kinds of orders in the periphery of poisons. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I've got two sort of questions, stroke comments. The first one is to to Marco. I mean, I'm I'm surprised by the choice of um, words and concepts because I mean, despotism is is really rather specific, whereas you know a lot of what you talk about seems to be more you know captured by authoritarian. You know, and, and, and also the nature of, of a lot of the, the political systems you talk about, you know, Turkey, China, Russia, and so on, is probably still much more of a collective leadership rather than an autocrat or a despot at the top who is in control of everything. I mean, there's lots of infighting within these political systems, you know. And so, yes, you might not have a formal opposition, but you have lots of factions and clans and so on that vie for power and influence inside rather than an institutional formal opposition in the way that, that the West might have. But then the Western model doesn't seem to be going very well. Russell has already alluded to some of this. Uh, and not just that, you know, we have conformism. We also now have demonization, where now the official opposition is completely delegitimized. You know, we have the lock her up crooked Hillary versus, you know, oh, Trump is, is a Russian you know, asset or agent. So even the, the, the Western formal oppositional model doesn't seem to be going very well. Why? Because we don't have a political culture that actually does promote proper 
debate and disagreement. So I, I'm not sure the Western model that you so uh, laud is, is, is working very well. And, and to Andrew very briefly, I'm just interested how maybe this um, sort of binary of, of utopia and dystopia fits into messianism, because I think that what's interesting about recent developments is that we're see, seeing a sort of resurgence of utopian thinking and, and utopian ideologies. Whereas, you know, we've been told, you know, the age of revolution is over, the age of ideology is over, you know, the whole end of history stuff. But it seems to be that, you know, utopia and dystopia are kind of key, I think, conceptual uh, sort of uh, frameworks we need to understand this kind of messi messianism that you talk about very, very eloquently. I like very much this presentation of Akita no Jo, the manga really model of the Neketsu uh, in uh, Jap Japan and this linked with the story, history of uh, Japan and the survival of uh, Japan people after the collapse of uh, their empire. It's uh, really interesting. My question is, uh, or remark is uh, more about this uh, this time uh, because uh, the figure of America in uh, this in this time in uh, ja Japanese uh, movies of Yakuza uh, GI I pre present as as all and uh, the, as imperialist uh, and uh, and Yakuza as a knight against this uh, American and. What is in Akita Nojo the figure of uh, America in uh, this figure of her? And I, and, and I guess this figure of her. Thank you. So, uh, uh, can you please respond in the same order as we presented? So, maybe briefly, Ms. Uh, Wayne. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I can't think of any instances of America appearing other than that time. Whenever the uh, central figures like Joe or his coach encounter any foreigner, they try to speak to them in like, broken English that they might have picked up from movies or something like that. But there is a Yakuza presence, which is uh, interesting. Uh, one of the slides I flew by is just uh, in pre preparation for the fight with Harima. Uh, a Yakuza takes about 10 of his people to uh, attack Joe from all directions to simulate the unpredictability of this wild creature that he's going to fight. Adam, I agree with what you say uh, about the, uh, uh, the lack, the uh, in success, on success of, of, of our model of that what you were mentioning. But this is another bit of another problem. The problem is that one of the great uh, disillusionments that we have suffered in the last 30 years is that our systems uh, open, giving every opportunity to everybody, enhancing all sorts of possibility. Uh, the, the, the expectation was that a certain, not, not a great amount of elite, but some elite would manage to float up to power, to government, to and this has been completely disattended by history because we have people who I mean all, all, all you have to do is listen to the talks of Mr. Salvini, of our uh, vice president of uh, Italy, or Mr. Trump. I mean, they speak like you speak in a, in a, in a coffee bar. You know, I mean, the the vulgar people, the, the people who you know. And so the the idea that these people have that somebody like Trump, somebody like Salvini, somebody like Di Maio, many, many others that can come around, can go to govern a, a great country. What we have, we are 60 million people, and we're ruled by people who have no preparation, who are presumptuous, they are uh, bully, and they are incompetent. So we, have, so we, and we are a democratic country. They voted, you know, and the fact that they've been voted doesn't it should mean something. So we, we have to do something about the people who vote these people also. 
education, education, education. People must read as. The way I was saying yes, yeah, history, read history. Because you know that if you don't speak about China and don't read the history of China, now, I don't have to give a story of China that you were mentioning about the 1900s and all the things that happened in the 1900s. I know because my grandfather was there, so the 1900 in China was something absolutely, I mean, it's an extremely complex world. And in, so, so China, 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 China. Xinjiang and the regions and all the, all the various systems. Um, for instance, nobody mentions, excuse me, one, one thing, well, nobody mentions that America has in, invented only recently, some, no, not very recently, but some 80 years ago, something I call the Conference for National uh, Legislators. They meet, they maintain equilibrium between the, the states and try to maintain equilibrium with the, with the, with the federal, federal state. Which is something which could be, has been completely disattended by, for instance, by the European Union. So we have this parliament in in, 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 in Brussels, who's supposed to be, you know, with nine, 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 900 people, who's supposed to govern over 500, 500 billion. I mean, you know, with the different people who people commute and go and they don't even know each other. I mean, this is, uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, just uh, Lars and, and Adrian. <laughs> very apt in revealing comments. They're, they're much appreciated. I'll just very briefly. Respond to each. Lars, what I find so helpful in your comment is that you basically identify two exemplars with interventionism, particularly, let's say, the R2P variant with its, you know, humanitarian messianism and climate change, two exemplars that couldn't do more to illustrate the spatio -temporal, temporal transformations of politics right now and what is at stake and thereby, you know, kind of pulling into relief the new sorts of political circumstances in which impulses towards salvation, impulses towards hegemony and imperial control, that are implicit in the structure of statehood, even as the structure of state sovereignty is being fundamentally challenged by both of the instances that you underscore. So, <clears throat> tremendously happy. Adrian, your point is very well taken. Uh, it, it's funny because in a footnote, I am on this matter of definitions, you know, struggling towards clear definitions of everything. Actually, in a footnote in the paper, I'm working to distinguish utopianism from messianism because, of course, there is an important distinction there in the sense that arguably messianism requires a more radical kind of transformation of human subjectivity and history, let's say of humankind within history, than utopianism does. Utopianism being something that, at least in theory, can be achieved in, a terrest in, in, in humankind as we know it, let's say it that way, whereas messianism requires something other. So your point about utopian and dystopian, I think, goes to the need for me to continue thinking about the distinction between those two terms in particular, mm -hmm. the utopian and, and the messian. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, all panelists. Uh, thank you, audience. <laughs>